So I'll call this to order. This is the Committee on Legislative, Le Legislative Matters, meeting for March 14, 2016. I'm Councilor David Murphy. Councilor Lyle O'Donnell is here. Uh, Julie Sher is here. And Councilor Adams, we hope rockets in at any moment before we get started. Um, um, I'd ask for public comment, but there is actually no public in, in the room to comment. So if they come later, we may revisit that, but there's no public here now. And can I have um, a motion on the minutes of February 8th? Second. Any discussion on those? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the first item we have is 16.003, ordinance to delete fees from chapter 174 of the city code book. <clears throat> and I'll read it, it's pretty straightforward. Ordinance to delete fees from Chapter 174 of the Code Book and Ordinance of the City of Northampton, providing that the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 174 of said Code, providing for fees, be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in City Council assembled as follows: Section 1, that Chapter 164 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton to be amended so that such fees read as follows: Delete. Pretty straightforward. Uh, chapter 174 shall be deleted in its entirety and replaced with the following wording, reserved uh, CP schedule on the website. And I think primarily the reason for this is so that the department has can set reasonable fees and it doesn't always have to be ordinance in the, in the future. Um, so <coughs> for purposes of discussion, do we have a motion on this one? Not to discuss it. And most I would move to be a, I guess, a neutral recommendation. I guess. Yeah, I guess I'll move a neutral recommendation for discussion. Okay. Okay, discussion. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, you wanted Ellen. Well, well, I mean, this came up in the Ordinance Review Committee, and Pam actually passed out an advisory memo from the Department um, Department of Revenue Division of Local Services advising um, cities and towns on the implementation implementation of this, which is essentially a result of the city having previously accepted um, a chapter of Mass General Law to allow it to set fees administratively, so we don't have them all in code. One question was whether or not the city council can still set fees if it wish. I don't know that all of us would be really eager to be setting a bunch of fees all the time, but it's an important question. Mm -hmm. Another question that came up was, if a fee goes up dramatically over a certain percentage over a certain period of time, could that potential potentially trigger a hearing of some kind? Because when you're taking fees and you're, you're removing them from the city council and giving them to the executive, there's a, an accountability there, but it's a four-year accountability for the mayor, and it's a different kind of accountability. So the question is, how would that be done? The response, I think, practically is, Fees, fees have to be for the service that's actually provided. You can't just make up a number. I think that would be the response. I think this, I would expect the solicitor to say that. But in, in the guidance from the state, it said very clearly, this, this it does not mean that the city council can't set fees. Mm -hmm. And I wanted some, some guidance on that because we might want some language in there that we shouldn't maybe just have delete. We should have something about hearing something about whether the council can set fees if it wishes, and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, the uh, the test on it is that they can administratively set fees, and I think uh, we're going to involve Carolyn here since she's stuck with us. She might as well participate. Uh, but when you folks set fees, the test is the the fee can cover the reasonable expenses to provide the service, but if in fact the fee is be above and beyond that, the courts call it a tax, and we can't do that, right? So it has to be a fee sufficient to cover the cost of providing the service that the fee is for, but if it's excessive, the difference is a tax, and they strike it. And we had a case on that with the fire department, I think, some years ago, where they, it, it actually, it was a Northampton case. Florence Hardware took the fire department to court. Remember that over, they set some fee to inspect their storage of paint thinner and stuff like that. And they went to court and said it's excessive and the court struck the fee down and said, you're right, 
you can only charge blank for that kind of service. I think there may have been a fee somewhere in the statute or something, and they said, no, 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 you can't charge that extra money because, in our opinion, it's in excess of the work required to remember that case. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's true. But then again, we're we're working on the water and sewer rates now, and you could say that the water and sewer rates have to be for the service provider. Right. But yet, there's wiggle room. Otherwise, I don't know why we vote on it. And the wiggle room has to do with how much we're planning to the future. What's the arc mm -hmm. of the, you know how much are we putting away for capital reserves? So there's some there's some policy that is made. In this case, it's being shifted entirely to the mayor, which may be fine. I just I want yeah you know, I have some interest in some accountability mechanisms, and maybe that's not possible. But there are follow-up questions that we raise with the solicitor that. Maybe we can deal with in full city council. I'd rather not be like a big like, you know, production in city council. Um, hmm. yeah. so. But I think that's how we go where we are mm -hmm. is they're gonna, you know, to not bring them all here. Although we specifically in, in the mayor's administrative order, I think that's how we wound up with the with the responsibility of setting the fees for water sewer. So there would be some political involvement in it, mm -hmm. that there would there would be a body setting the fees that were elected, not appointed, that there would be some public re recall for us if we set crazy water rates that, that they'd be able to hunt us down and unelect us for that. Because it was DPW before, and they were all appointed, so they didn't really have any. Mm -hmm. right. they, they weren't answering to the public the like theoretically we do. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. so. so I mean, I have those questions, but I mean, I would say that if we're gonna, if you want, if there's interest in moving it forward, we need to change the language a little bit because we shouldn't have a reference to the website in the code board. That says, you know, <laughs> we shouldn't, you know, we could have like call call David Murphy at four one three five five five. So I would I would suggest that if it is going to move forward, and in the meantime anyway, I would move to amend it so it simply reads chapter one seventy four has been reserved, delivered. yeah, or reserved or something. I think that's frequently what we do in other sections. No, yeah, yeah, we do that, but no reference to uh, where fees may be found. Yeah. No, and that's just the thing. That's one of the, one of the things that we could set as a policy because we can't. There are certain things the city council can't do legislatively to cross over the administrative executive side. But we can set broad policy, and one policy should, could be fees shall be conspicuously posted online for public review, even if that were to happen. We could expect that with this mayor to happen anyway, but also we should remember that this is a policy we're setting for the future, for future city councils and mayors. So that's my interest. Anyway, but yeah, you could have that in there. But unless we're ready to write that language, I would just have just to. send it. Follow through by sending it with no recommendation, and I mean, then Thursday they can we can deal with it. Yeah, I mean, my interest is in, is in improving this ordinance. It's not really to hold it up. I'm all in favor of. The city having accepted this law, I just think it would be mm -hmm. a good idea to make sure we have the right accountability mechanisms. Do we think that Alice going to be there on Thursday? No, but we can certainly ask this question of him. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, you know, thinking about it, this didn't rise to that level with me. I yeah. think we could improve delete section 174. Uh -huh. you know, the language seems pretty uh -huh. good. <laughs> no, and I understand that. that. Yeah, no. And I think the improvements we make, we would make, if any, would be marginal and somewhat kind of overbuilding it because like I say I would expect the mayor to do them anyway but mm -hmm. it's sort of a policy for future mayors it's kind of like when you when you debate the charter what basic rules do you want in there no matter who occupies the office mm -hmm. so that's what I would move for now I would move we make that change just as chapter 174 reserved and delete the uh, reference to the website yes mm -hmm. so do we have a second that that? you want a second that amendment any more discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Delete that and it'll show up again on Thursday. Okay. Do oh, you want to vote on the actual recommendation? Or that's so we just did? No, no, no. We just vote on the amendment. Okay. So then all in favor of a neutral recommendation, say aye. 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 Good. Okay. It's done for. Now Carolyn's on. This is an ordinance pertaining to LED lighting. And let's see. I have copies of modifications coming out of the last two committees. If you want. Literally, I feel like I've got 
to look at other sections that were confusing or that were not interpreted the way or not written the way the code's been interpreted for a long time. So we wanted to make sure those two things matched. Um, but in order to do that, we, the planning board looked at current regulations on sign and, signs and lightings and um, evaluated how there, there were distinctions between um, the residential districts and the commercial districts. Um, and this code, the code changes um, are just about signs that are for on-premise or on-property, um, ground signs and wall signs. We've already addressed um, billboard signs or off-premise signs, and LED um, lighting is not allowed at all for um, billboard signs. So that's not part of this um, regulation that was addressed I don't know, a couple years ago. Um, so this sort of came about, we've had um, regulations of flashing signs, so neon signs and other kinds of lit signs since 1975, but it's been very vague and it um, has varied from being in the planning board's jurisdiction to determine what um, uh, might be a cause for concern for safety and what, it, um, what should be allowed. It's also fluctuated to go into the police chief's purview to determine. And so currently, it's gone back and forth. Currently, the way the ordinance reads now, that flashing signs that are not traffic-related signs um, have to be reviewed and approved by the police chief, whereas everything else related to signs are in either the zoning board's jurisdiction or just by right in the code. Um, so we took a look at um, at that and also did some research on what um, there's some traffic safety um, there's a traffic safety organization nationally that did a um, study in 2009 about these LED signs they looked at billboard signs they also looked at business signs and looked at both safety issues and aesthetic issues so the planning board looked at the recommendations that came out of that national report and um, they the report the traffic um, uh, transportation safety officers um, felt it was very important for local um, communities to create guidance on LED signs because there are very um, distracting mechanisms that can be incorporated into these signs that um, create unsafe situations for drivers on the road network. Um, so some of the recommendations that um, they made were to look at distinctions between residential districts, the timing of sign lights, um, meaning how long the display can be on a sign before it transitions, and then how quickly it transitions, and what kind of information is on those signs. Um, so the planning board evaluated those recommendations and looked at our current regulations where, where we have, we allow lighted signs in both commercial districts and residential districts but there's no um, distinction about illumination levels or the time that sign lights can be operational in residential districts or commercial districts. And sort of lighting in general for signs is, is treated the same currently in, in both those types of districts. Um, so what's in front of you is um, our changes to define 
what an LED sign is and create uh, guidance um, for commercial districts that are that's different than what would be allowed in a residential district for for LED signage um, and also to more specifically specify that there's a curfew essentially in residential districts for any um, LED sign that might be installed and the types of signs in residential districts are much um, more limited than they are in commercial districts so we allow signs for um, nursing homes and schools and um, religious institutions um, and I think there's another and then um, that, that covers pretty much the ground signs but all signs are also allowed as part of um, um, home businesses and bed and breakfast establishments. So that's pretty. That's the pretty much the extent to residential signs um, that are allowed currently in the code. Um, so the ordinance, um, just sort of taking the initial um, paragraph on this in this code. Um, talks about, defines LED and then specifies that it's regulated by this code and no longer by the police chief is the first change. Um, and then the second section, which is new, which is on the second page of the top, the second page is the section that was added since this ordinance was introduced and it was and the reason why this um, clarification was added is section 7.2b um, was to um, create consistency in the way that city's been interpreting what's allowed as a directional sign that's at a driveway that's just um, mostly for traffic direction people entering driveways they might not be clear that you're going to a certain address so we allowed um, lower scale um, directional signs that the way that this is written now, the red line version that's in front of you is the way that's always been interpreted, but the original language was not the way that we had been interpreting it. And we just um, frankly discovered that <laughs> with it, the zoning board, there were some members of the zoning board that pointed that out. Um, so we wanted to make that correction. And the highlighted um, words shall um, are just to replace um, the word may in that um, section. Um, section 7.2e, the next paragraph, was also added since the ordinance was initially introduced to council. And that was, um, we added that because the planning board had been discussing for several months and frankly just fell off the table when we um, were introducing all these other changes but to restrict the allowance for special permit for heights, um, uh, for increased sign heights in districts, and this would really relate to commercial districts more than um, residential. Uh, currently, the Zoning Board of Appeals may issue a special permit for bigger signs or signs, um, more signs than are typically allowed by right, and the way it currently reads is they could also issue a special permit for greater heights. The um, zoning board pretty consistently hasn't been issuing um, special permits for taller signs over the last several years uh, because we now have gateway corridor plans and also we've changed some zoning for King Street, Pleasant Street, and sort of the core commercial areas um, that really is focused on multiple access, so access by pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles, and so the lower, shorter signs, they're still 15, they're still allowed to be 15 feet in height, but um, allowing signs taller than 15 feet is inconsistent with the plans for those gateway um, corridors. So um, that's why the proposal is on the table not to allow the heights to be altered through special permit. And so as you probably are aware, um, signs on King Street have, as they've, as they've been replaced, have come down in height. They've, they've been as high as 30 feet or, or taller from the 1960s forward, and now they're all 15 feet or lower, uh, shorter. Um, so
so this would maintain that um, um, that standard. What was the example that you showed at Community Resources? Was it the Acme sign? There was one sign that was like yeah, and Acme is really tall. tall. <laughs> yeah, it's mm -hmm. really tall. But yeah. it's really old. Yeah. Yes. And the original Kingsgate Plaza sign was also very high. Right. And then so all of those, so the Honda, all the car dealership signs are actually, I think between 10 and 13 feet. I don't even know if they're even the maximum 15 feet high anymore. So. Well, it's hard when you're texting to look up 30 feet. 15 is much easier. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so that 72 E and M relate to the um, elimination of the special permit provision for taller signs. Mm -hmm. 72T is um, defines um, dynamic display and a highlighted and electronic um, came out of planning board hearing that they had a discussion about whether video, the word video was um, descriptive enough or um, I guess broad enough actually because so anyway they recommend changing video to an electronic so it sort of covers everything. Um, so that's what that change is moving forward out of public hearing. Otherwise, this, this definition has come out of standards that have been used around the country for defining um, these types of signs, dynamic display boards. Um, uh, turning over to the end of that paragraph, um, the rec planning board also recommended to delete the end of that one sentence um, uh, for mobile signs that are parked in parking lots that um, deleting primary purpose of advertising would just make it, um, uh, would open the door for um, controversy, I guess, or disagreement yeah, over whether it's for advertising or not. Yeah. Right. <coughs> you go west, it could be Right. Um, then 7.3C is um, the first paragraph is um, really just clarifying we had for a long time the sign code was um, confusing for staff and people trying to create signs so this is to break up these paragraphs and distinguish between membership club signage that's allowed and then churches and community facilities and then to allow with um, churches or schools um, institutional uses to allow LED display signs but particularly with um, um, signs that don't change more frequently than once every 30 minutes in the residential district and when it changes when it transitions that it's instant it's not um, fading doesn't, or blanking it doesn't scroll or, or scroll it just, it just right goes quick. right um, <clears throat> and that if images are displayed that they're non-changing they're not video images and that they um, be only allowed between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. and that there are light level standards um, no greater than 0.3 foot candles above the ambient light conditions <clears throat> um, that must be pretty hard to measure. Well, it may we it is possible to measure, but it's also uh, these sign companies have spe specifications for how much light is being um, output from the signs themselves. So um, we have the me uh, a means of getting that information before the signs yeah. installed. Because I mean, they probably need to sense ambient light so they know. You know, because when it, right. as it's getting darker, ambient light at noon is going to be one thing. Ambient light before it shuts off at 10 o'clock at night is going to be something else. So it's probably going to sense ambient light right. to then know to be three foot candles greater. But I don't know how you measure it because trying to delineate three foot candles in the middle of the day often electronic signs are going to be kind of hard. But. That's true. I think the. Um, bigger issue would be at nighttime, the nighttime light levels. So, and they also typically have a photo cell that dims at night, mm -hmm. so they're slightly brighter. Well, you'd be able, it would, you would be able to tell three foot candles above dark, but right. at noon it's going to be a little harder. Right. right. Um, 
The next section also um, um, allows for lighted signs on home uh, bed and breakfast, but stipulates a, the hours in which the, that would be allowed. Um, and this would not, so this could be any kind of lit sign. And then the other, the highlighted item four, um, there, to this point, there hasn't been um, a height limit for ground signs in the residential district, but the, except for as it relates to um, residential subdivisions or um, condominium projects, if they have a, you know, a name saying, you know, welcome to whatever Bear Hill Estates, that has a five foot maximum height, but no other signs in the residential district do. So the planning board, that would be yeah, felt that was important to um, add that. Um, and then the next section for B6 um, goes into commercial districts. And here, the difference in um, the minimum time display to be 30 seconds. It was introduced at one minute, so there's a lot of discussion at planning board. The original, the um, committee on community resources um, talked a little bit about where that number came from, but didn't make a recommendation. And then the planning board had further discussion about that and um, uh, determined that bringing it down to 30 seconds. Um, would be more beneficial to businesses. They want to change their message more frequently. And they also, through that discussion, recommended to change the um, curfew, if you will, for the time the signs should be turned off from 10 to 11 or um, at the close of business, which is, whichever is later. So that distinguishes it from the residential curfew of 10 p.m. Um, and then 74D talks about prohibiting sounds from being emitted from these signs. Um, and that does not, would not apply to um, a board that might be, you know, an like example I can think of is at a fast food restaurant when typically so you're the the in a box board. can still talk to you? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so that only applies to signs on the street, so where sound would be a lot more distracting to drivers than if you're just ordering your Happy Meal or whatever. Um, and then sort of the similar standards would apply in the industrial districts too. And that's what the rest of those changes relate to. Mm -hmm. and that's it. So with the uh risk of being too time consuming. I just want to read through it real quickly. Oh, sure. Because we've been going through it, but the nice folks watching the home version of this couldn't really follow us without a script. So right. I'm just going to do it. And we did, the planning board went through it thoroughly too in their public hearing that was um, taped for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this got changed a little bit. Right? Um, through, their, um, through their discussion, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to read through it real quick. And if you've got any questions, just interrupted make sure we understand it. so um, this is zoning so it's 357 2 of the code of ordinances a uh, 72b amended to show uh, as follows a sign including temporary interior window displays or banners or its illuminators shall not by reason of its location shape size color interfere with traffic or be confused or obstruct the view or effectiveness of any official traffic sign, traffic signal, traffic marking. A sign or any part thereof which moves or flashes, except that such portions of a sign as consistent solely uh, of indicators of time and or temperature shall comply with the requirements herein as dynamic display. Everybody good with that? Hearing. Yep. And then all illuminations of signs must conform with 350.12-2. 72D. Uh, this 
is the lim the limitations as to the number of signs permitted does not apply to traffic or directional signs which are necessary for the safety and direction of residents employees customers and visitors whether on vehicle or on foot of the business industry or residents such signs um, shall Not. Shall not. Yeah, it's, it's just the May. Word May. So May was deleted. Right. Okay. Shall not exceed a maximum height, a maximum size of six square feet. Uh, shall not be higher, uh, top of sign than four feet from the ground. Shall be limited to one such directional side per curb cut. If lighted, shall be illuminated internally or by indirect method with white light only and shall be in conformance with 350 12-2. Signs may carry the name of the business or project provided that uh, said name is clearly secondary in the nature, uh, in nature to the primary directional function of the sign uh, and no greater than one half the size of the directional message. And then we deleted a whole bunch of other stuff. So strike the word signs in <clears throat> number five. In five. Start with May. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? We I didn't we just add an S or signs? There was another one. So you just start that with May. That starts with May. Okay. So okay. Uh, 72E. Along with the height restriction herein, under no circumstances shall a sign together with any supporting framework extend above the roof line of the associated structure on site. In the case of a building with a pitched roof, the eave line of the building shall be considered the roof line. I'm sorry to go back, but again on number five, A and B, mm -hmm. is that and? Each of those conditions have to be satisfied. Clearly secondary in nature, the primary directional function of the sign. Yeah. And okay, is that? Would you say that's that's clear from the way it's written? Um, yeah, the word and. Well, I'll just. Yeah. Call and. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Seven two point E. Yeah. So with E. Um, in the case of a building with a pitch roof, the E line of the building shall be considered the roof line. So the placement of signs on a pitch roof, you have to pay, put them on the face of the building, yeah. but you can't, you couldn't set it up right. on the roof itself. Right. Don't a lot of businesses do that on a pitch roof, set them on the, on the roof above the eave? Mm -hmm. They're usually face signs, face walls. Now, I'm just thinking, so this is, so if there is, a porch or some structure coming off the front of the building. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a porch and then the building. The porch roof's okay, right? But not the top of the building. Is no, not eat? on top of the porch roof. It would be on the face of the building. Right, but if, if the porch is uh, on the first level yeah. and the eave line is on the second level, then the porch is fair game. Because it's on the face of the, it's like first story, porch roof, Eve up here, second story, porch, first story. And a lot of people mount signs on a porch on a first floor. Um, but you're just talking about the porch wall. No, well, no, the, the, the roof of the, oh, we, they've hidden our chalkboard. But you've got a, a two story building yeah. with a pitch roof. And at the first floor level, there's a porch. Right. So there's a porch roof here. Yeah. So it is below the eave line at the top of the building. Right. But, but above the porch roof. But it, it's above, it's at the first floor line like this. And a lot of people put signs on those. It's not above the top of the building, it's yeah. along that roof line of that porch because the roof line blocks the face of the building so right. you can't get to the face of the building. Right. As long as it, if I understand you correctly, it can go on that face, but not on the actual roof of the porch of that first floor porch. But the that porch, would be considered a roof too. But the porch blocks the face of the building, so the porch is eliminating your ability to put it on the face of the building. Right. So you put it above the roof of the porch on the face of the building. 
because it's below the right below the upper E one. But you can't. The reason for that is. Well, uh, the reason is you have a roof like this. You don't want projecting signs up Why not? above. Um, They're actually kind of commonplace. I can't even think of it. I got some on my building in Florence. That's commonplace. They've been there a long time. Yeah. On the porch roof. They stand up on the porch roof so they're not Okay. So they're not on the wall of the building up here. They're sort of over the business that the porch goes into. But they don't hang below the porch because that would block visual looking out the windows. Right. And they're not they don't, up above. They don't project above the porch roof, though, do they? They do not uh, project above the top of the porch roof. They're okay. on the porch yeah. roof, so they don't block the windows yeah, yeah, of the second fine. floor and they don't, you know, yeah. so they're not, they're, they're right. on the roof of the porch so that they don't block the front of people looking out and they don't go high enough to reach the top of the porch so you can look out the second floor windows. Right, right. I think that's okay. You I think? have to look at your example though. So but I think I know what you're saying. The roof line is where the roof is then going and touching the, the wall of the house, presumably below the windows. Right. And so that's allowable under your yeah. proposed line. Right. Two story building, first floor porch. Sign here. Does that look? So that's okay. Yeah, so this doesn't go above the roof line of the porch, but because this is here, it blocks your ability to put it on the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can't use the front of the building here because the porch blocks it, but you could do this on the porch. It doesn't go above the roof line of the porch, it doesn't block the windows up here. It's over the business that may be in there. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the way this is written is that that would be allowed. I haven't seen that in too many cases. That's probably a pre-existing sign that's been there forever and ever, because we usually don't get applications for that. But the other piece of it is we don't have a lot of residential, we don't have a ton of residential style buildings in the commercial district in which we allow wall signs anyway. Yeah. Is the point of confusion the word roof line? Is that well defined? Well, E. Yeah, that what says here. What says E? Right. Well, it talks about it. That it should not be above the E. Right. You know, so. So that porch is not an E. Yeah. So no, what they what they be saying is you can't put it way the hell up here. Right. You know, this is the the top of the building. Right. Um, but this is a roof, <laughs> and it's not. It's below the E. Right. So what's the eaves line? This it's right there. This yeah. thing right here. Yeah. You know, you're talking about the other roof. Well, no, no, we're talking about E, so I'm just asking. Yeah, is, this ordinance addresses the up, the E this one line. Up here. So the little roof below does, does not the have The porch roof. E. No. No, if this is this is the E here for the building, this is the top of a porch, because you do see them okay. like on porch roofs and things. So because if you put it, if you hung it over here, it would block the view out of the building yeah. and through the porch. Yeah. And if you put it too high, it blocks the windows here. Yeah. But you can't put it here because the porch roof's there. So you stick it out here, it doesn't block these windows, it doesn't block these windows, and it doesn't rise above this, so what's behind it is simply the roof. So it's not just, you know, it's sort of, okay. So survey says it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I say this on the language thing? Why, why does it say under no circumstances shall instead of no sign? It just seems like the no sign is, is clearer. There's a reason why that kind of. Uh, I'm wondering if it carried over. Uh, no, that's fine. Are you changing? Yeah, you want to delete that? Sure. No sign. But then, but then you would need to add. But then you need to add the other shell back. So it says, along with the height restrictions here, right. and no sign. The other thing supporting framework shall extend. Right. Yep. I just feel like, I'm sorry to focus on deep, but it seems like it makes it more intelligible. That's fine. It's fairly dense. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Okay, so 72M, 
The Board of Appeals shall issue a special permit allowing more than the number of signs herein permitted and or for signs larger of larger size but not taller than herein permitted provided that. Um, this is new. Uh, dynamic display sign uh, that, that let's see permitted provided that dynamic, dynamic display sign means any sign designed for outdoor use that is capable of displaying an electronic signal included but not limited to uh, cathode ray tubes, light emitting diodes, displays, plasma displays, liquid crystal displays, or other technology used in commercially available televisions or computer monitors. Signs with this technology which are placed uh, by a public agency for the purposes of directing or regulating pedestrian or vehicle movement uses are exempt from this ordinance. <laughs> Why didn't that pick get picked up? <laughs> That's weird. Maybe because it's under one. I might have picked it up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Seven two U new subsection in general science standards prohibit mobile uh, displays. Uh, a dynamic display sign on, in, or part of any portable mobile vehicle parked in view of a public way, whether registered or unregistered, and which carries or displays any sign or billboard. Uh, it deleted its primary purposes of ag um, advertising. Will be regulated as a ground sign. Um, sir? Yes. Yeah. Was there something that precipitated this? Do we have a lot of Those little trailer signs? I'm yeah, it'd be a trailer sign, but um, actually it came out of the Ashto report um, to because they looked at different types of signs that create distractions to motor vehicle traffic. Um, so we added that, and and the city through zoning can't regulate um, vehicles on the road. So trucks that have a video screen on the side that's under the jurisdiction, I believe, of the police department. So you can't park one of those trucks. You have to keep moving or putting it <laughs> right. in the You can never no, stop. You if you moving. park one, then it can fall under zoning by this language. But if it's a move, if it's a bus or whatever other vehicle on the street network, the zoning language um, it is not applicable when it's in motion. So this covers. Illuminated and not illuminated signs on vehicles, or just illuminated? Um, this is just illuminated. Just illuminated. Okay. Yeah. So, the PBTA bus that parks in front of John and Green with a big sign on it yeah. is okay, unless they make it illuminated, in which case. Well, no, because if it's just parked because it's picking up passengers, that's different than if it's <coughs> parked and the driver's gone and. Went to get a coffee or something. <laughs> well. That is there for more than, you know, if it's there for, I don't know, 30 seconds. No, I'm making up the number. But it's, it's meant to be off road. So if it's not in the vehicle travel lane, mm -hmm. then, and it has a lighted display, then it'll be regulated by this as a ground sign. Mm -hmm. And this would include an illuminated sign on a vehicle that was parked? Yes. Is the, the last phrase in parentheses see relevant district allowances for ground signs? Right. Is that, is that part of the ordinance? It's proposed as being part of the ordinance. Okay. Because they're different. So in the sign section, there are different types of ground signs allowed depending on the district. So if um, I had uh, a trailer with a lit lighted sign and I parked it in a residential district, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be allowed to have a ground sign in a residential district. Uh -huh. So that would tell me I couldn't look, uh, couldn't be there at all. If I were in a commercial district, then we'd look at uh -huh. if there's already a ground sign there. If it needs a you know special permit for an additional ground sign or whatever. Um, can we say something clearer? Like we'll be regulated as a ground sign subject to. And then whatever section sets out those differences. Well, you could say herein. 
because this is the sign section. Now, how about political signs? That's different. Can't regulate those. No, you can, um, and we do. It's in a different subsection of seven. So they're allowed for um, up until you have to take them down like 30. Because I remember our, our, our dear friend, Councilor Doslow, always used to put a relatively large political sign in the back of his pickup truck. Yep. <laughs> I actually think that there should be a carve out for political speech in the sign ordinance generally. There is. is it's just not it's in not here in because we're not, we're, not per, we're not recommending a change yes, to that. And these are carve out because I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I, you know, I know there's part of the zoning that says you can only have so many lawn signs of certain size for a certain period of time. Yep. Which I think is unconstitutional, but probably popular. So. Well, um, there's, it's, there's specifically, it says that there's a, an allowance for signs for political purposes for, you know, for example, for an election, you sure, can have sure. them up for a limited amount yeah. of time. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think that's enough. Is there a more general car that you were referencing? Yeah. Okay, so that's what you're saying. Yeah. Well, do you think it would, um, can we just get rid of C relevant district allowances for ground signs? Is that necessary to have? No. Okay. That's what I was suggesting. Okay. So we go up to uh, 7C, 73C, ready for that one? Institutional and other non residential uses in a residential district uh, allowed in conformance or in accordance with each membership club, funeral establishment, nursing care facility, um, or may. Oh, um, may, it should be or. Nursing care facility yeah. may have one ground identification sign up to a maximum of 10 square feet in surface area. If signs were illuminated, they may only be illuminated between the hours of 7 a.m. And 10 p.m. and this is residential, right? Right. Okay. But you got to be uh, a membership club, funeral establishment, nursing care facility to do that. That's one type of category. Then the second category is a whole other series of uses. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is 2C. Uh, churches, uh, community schools. Centers. There's a word plopped in there. <laughs> I got churches, community, oh, centers in the middle of the yeah. Churches, community centers, schools may have one ground sign up to a maximum of 40 square feet in surface area. Such signs shall be set back at least half the required depth of the front yard setback. So they have to be in, in the setback, but halfway back um they don't yeah um they don't have to be in a setback they but they got to be, be minimum a minimum of half, half that front setback okay yeah. um signs may only be illuminated between the hours of 7 a.m and 10 p.m signs may contain dynamic displays as identified in t in and 7 to t above so long as the following are met the dynamic display area may be no more than one half of the total sign area. <laughs> minimum display time between, or minimum display time between display changes shall be 30 minutes. Transition time to the next display shall be less than one second. Display boards shall not emit sound. If images are displayed, only static, non-fluctuating, non-changing video images are allowed. Signs may have photo cells that automatically or must, signs must have photo cells that automatically dim in the dark, conditions in direct correlation to ambient light conditions at no time. Shall the sign lights be greater than uh, point, is that point three or three? Point three. Point three foot candles above ambient light conditions. I thought it was three, but measuring point three is really. 
Um, yeah, it's because of the way the LED signs are, it's not the same as having a direct LED sign. So it has, and a lot of it, it's, um, there's a different way of measuring it. Um, so this is the number that was, that has been used in other communities. Um, so like, uh, I'll just note that this is this section we talked about a bit in community resources. Uh -huh. um, in particular, B, um, the the time between display changes, and it seems like this has been discussed all along. And thirty minutes sounds like a lot to a lot of people, but no one can really come up with another yeah. number. And, and this is the one you change for commercial, right? That could change. Right. It was already shorter. It was much shorter. One minute. Right. The planning. So, I don't want to interrupt you. Sorry. Oh no no no. Go ahead. Um, yeah. The planning board um, reevaluated that number and felt like this is a residential district. Changing signs in residential districts has a lot uh, has a greater potential for impact on abutting residences, and so. Um, the type of signs that are allowed in residential, so they evaluate the type of signs that are allowed in residential, so churches, schools, community centers, and the potential impact for abiding residences, and felt that um, 30 minutes um, was um, a long enough time so that there wouldn't be, you know, sort of constant flickering lights out the windows. Um, so. They talked about reducing it. They, at some level, they didn't really, um, you know. Again, it's um, there's not a, there's no magic to that number, but they felt like going less than that um, was not really necessary based on the type of uses that um, might be incorporating the types. That's I mean, I'll just say that sort of the idea that there'd be constant flickering lights doesn't. I mean, doesn't really make sense though because it's an instantaneous instantaneous change that happens right so it's not like it's going to be you know it will without it will change message so quickly that it would be very hard to even process that change but like, you see the change when it's right. happening and so you know for instance if you're in the only one in a residential district that we have now is the high school right. So if you're near the high school, I mean the light is fairly bright coming off of that sign, and there's there yeah, that's next not, to it. Uh, and you can see that sign change. You know, even if you're not looking at it, you can mm -hmm. see it. Yeah, that's happen. not point three foot candles above ambient light. That thing. That, that's pretty bright. Yeah, it's pretty bright. And they have a lot of messaging, and there's a lot of discussion about whether, you know, that's that um, that messaging is appropriate in a residential district. That amount of messaging, you know, sort of constantly mm -hmm. turning over. Um, and they felt like, you know, this is, that's, that's sort of, they, they felt it was important to make that distinction in residential districts. Mm -hmm. um, and so the concern that we sort of brought up was, if, if it's changing only every 30 minutes, you're, and you have multiple messages you're trying to get out, you're never going to hit, it, or it's going to be hard for you to hit the same audience with more than one message, right? Mm -hmm. um, but your the point you made in particular about the high school sign was that it um, there was enough room on it so that you you're already going to have multiple messages happening. All right, you have three or four lines available for text, and it might be different in different situations. But for that one, I, mean, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know there are at least three lines on that one. So if you felt like you had to get three messages across, mm -hmm. you could plan your sign. But only really half of it would be. Only half of the space can be dynamic. Right. You know, but realistically, even if it was going to be five minutes, your ability to hit somebody with more than one message is pretty much gone anyway. Sure. Right. You know, it's not going to. So really, you're just, <clears throat> you just want to eliminate how frequently it goes click because you're, nobody's going to hang around for five minutes to wait to see what the next right. message is. So it really is just how often does it change less than a second. And they're talking about, you know, maybe, so for the high school, the board talked about if parents or people are coming to drop off in the morning, they might have one message or three messages. And then if the school felt it was so important, they could do three different messages at pickup in the afternoon. 
that used to apply to all of it was deleted, um, including provided that such signs, if lighted, shall be illuminated internally or by indirect method with white light only. Is that just no longer applicable because they're now they're entirely electronic and they're all illuminated internally? Because it, it seems like, unless that weren't the case, now there's no standard for how they would be illuminated indirectly. Um, so it just doesn't make any sense now. So, um, up until this point, we've said illuminated indirectly or with or internal, internally illuminated or direct indirect light. Um, and so it hasn't been broad enough to cover all types of lighting. So with this definition of um, um, dynamic display, um, so that's for moving sign. So the the first paragraph says illuminated. Um, just with whatever method. Um, we also, I don't think, I guess what I'm saying, I guess what the easiest, simplest way to describe it is that it's probably not necessary anymore because we have lighting standards anyway that came after this was all written. Oh, okay. So you can't uplight anything anyway. So you're going to have to have directed illumination levels or signs no matter what. And, um, probably any new signs unless you have, I mean, new signs will likely have some kind of direct LED lighting or this dynamic display. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, tourist home bed and breakfast establishments uh, may have one identification sign attached flush to the structure, not to exceed three square feet in surface area, provided that such sign if lighted uh, be in conformance with 350.12-2 uh, and may only be illuminated between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. Ground sign should not be taller than five feet above the average finish grade at the foot of the sign. Um, at some point, how about pre-existing non-conforming signs that somebody may you know, because you can change the lettering on a pre-existing non-conforming sign whenever you want, um, thanks to the case law. That used to be regulated, but the case law took care of that. Could somebody decide that rather than keeping to re-lettering their sign, they just put a display on a pre-existing non-conforming sign? Um, and call it re-lettering? No, it's not re-lettering. Because if you're talking about an, a box, yeah, but with take, letters. let's say they have a sign mm -hmm. and they decide, you know, I'm tired of relettering this sign. I'm just right. going to put a display on the sign instead of relettering it and relatter it by changing the display every now and then. Well, the sign itself would be allowed, but you'd have to conform to the standards for LED signs. So, the, the, so they may have a previously non conforming sign. And if you're just shaking out the panel, then that's allowed to just do that if you're not changing anything else about the sign. But then you, by installing an LED sign, you'd have to comply with the standards. For LED sign. Mm -hmm. But you could bolt it on the other sign. You could what? Yes, you could. Bolt, you could bolt yeah. it to the structure of the other sign. Yeah. Uh, but it could not replace the other sign. If the other sign was too big or the other sign was too this or that, it would still have if you're not changing the face area, then you can do that by right. Once you change the size of the, the display area, that's so what would trigger a reevaluation. So you might need to go to the zoning board. 
pre-existing sign. I'm not going to touch the sign. I'm just going to paint the thing and stick a display on it rather than letter the face of the right. sign. I'm just going to put a display on it mm -hmm. and then change it by changing the display. Right. I can do that. You can do that, but you'd still have, you'd have to comply with the LED standards. Right. So you. But could your be, sign can still be there. Right. So yeah. you you can't scroll, you can't flash, you can't be more right. than point three. Right. But you could you could take that sign right. and stick this thing over it yep. and say this is my new sign, right. and I don't have to go change the plastic letters or do whatever I do. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just a, a small thing. Can, I feel like there's three different ways we're spelling out foot or feet. We use FT, we use an apostrophe, we use a four letter word, and I don't know. Just something to keep it Conformity. Clear. Yeah, conforming use of the word. Um, I don't want to go through and identify all the. Okay. Different, yeah. Well, I'll just do a search. Well, All right, so 7.3D, for approved residential subdivisions, townhouses, multifamily, and open space developments. One ground sign identifying the development, provided that, if lighted, uh, may only be illuminated between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., no dynamic displays involved. We good with that? Um, 7.4B, uh, illumination for wall signs in a commercial district, in the commercial district sign section. Uh, dynamic displays shall comply with the following. A minimum display time between changes shall be 30 seconds, delete one minute. So minimum display time shall be 30 seconds. And this is the one that's 30 minutes in the residential right. zone. Okay. Um, transition time shall be less than one second. Display board shall not have its sound. Display must be turned off at 11 p.m. or at the close of business, whichever is later. Signs must have photo cells that are automatically dim in dark conditions in direct correlation to natural ambient light conditions at no time. Shall the sign be greater than 0.3 foot candles above ambient light conditions? Are we all good with that? Totally new section, right? Yes. This is commercial. Yeah, you're just adding this. This doesn't replace anything. You're just adding this in. Um, right? right under the illuminate. Right. Yeah. Seven four D business signs shall be permitted as ground signs. Uh, signs as dynamic displays. Yeah. Um, is that if your business sign shall be permitted as ground signs? Yeah, this 350.12 shouldn't be in there. Yeah. It's a bad reference. I mean, it references lighting, but it's in the wrong place. <laughs> okay, so we'll take that out of there. Uh, permitted as ground signs, uh, as dynamic displays, must comply with 74B6 above, except the following. Informational boards may emit sound only if such boards are used as an accessory to drive through sales and service establishments, and if they are not directed directly oriented towards the street, such boards are not considered ground signs under these provisions. So this is the Mickey D's kiosk and mm -hmm. order board and that sort of thing, so you can still talk to the client. Okay. Um, in industrial, uh, business park, and uh, that plant village? Yes. PV districts. The following exterior signs and no others are permitted. Uh, signs permitted in 357-3 residential districts subject to the same regulations. Uh, B business signs shall be permitted as follows uh, in all GI and business park districts and for uh, plain village districts as provided in subsection D below. Not more than two wall signs for each building provided that each sign, if lighted, it shall uh, comply with lighting standards 7 for B6, whether dynamic or static. In, in all, um, uh, let's see, OI, GI, and DP districts, and for 
PV districts as provided in the subsection D below one ground sign for each building, provided that if lighted, it shall comply with lighting standards in 7.4.B.6, whether dynamic or static display. We can go to that. I have, I have a question. Are you deleting the entirety of the current subsection D and replacing it completely with this? 740? Mm -hmm. Or are you talking about the industrial section? Well, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand exactly how the what exactly the ordinance is doing. I, I think it's not deleting anything else. These are just additions to 740. Um. All right. Let's go. Well, okay. I'm trying to wrap my head around it because the, the current language isn't isn't. I'm trying to patch together the current language with what you propose. Okay, and so, so you have that current language here? The current language has three sub bullets underneath it. And it says business signs shall be permitted as ground signs as follows. And so you're adding a sentence after that. But then you have three additional. Right, so this would add um, after this, this section would be inserted here. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have these stay the same. There's nothing that would change to those that are existing. And then these get inserted down below here at the various points for the industrial sign district. Um, they get inserted. I'm so sorry. this part here, mm -hmm. um, there's an industrial section all down here. Oh. So these get um, these elements just get um, added to those subsections. Okay. So uh, not uh, everything else stays the same. Uh huh. Okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around it because the first one says business signs shall be permitted as follows, and then it has this these enumerated conditions, and this one ends, <coughs> such boards are not considered ground signs under these provisions. It almost reverses it. No, that well, this sentence refers to the um, drive-through sales things right above it. So oh, under the like under the foregoing no, right. provisions. Yes. So under here. Okay. So this is about the um, the food ordering board. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Those wouldn't be considered as separate ground signs because they're not oriented oh, to the street. I thought these provisions then referred to oh, yeah. number one in the yeah. HP or M districts, blah blah blah. Number two were single line. Okay. Yeah. So maybe well, I should just say such sound boards are not considered well, ground signs under this provision. I guess what I'm saying is to me as I read this. I'm not clear how these three sub bullets connect to the new, the new language you've created. What are they for? Like they, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. I was just, I was just wondering if it would be clear if this or if there was a packet that included the entire sign ordinance with well, this inserted into it. Yeah, I, you know, and I want that was my kind of general comment is. It's often it's often confusing to wade through these zoning ordinances because there's so many changes that come, and we pull up different parts and make changes. So, okay. yeah, it would be helpful. And actually, I'm not sure I reviewed the final version before today. I'm not sure I, I had it, or if I did, I was reading the wrong one. Yeah. I'll just show you since you know we're pointing out different things. I just kind of want to read the whole thing. To yeah, no, and it's been very helpful to go we, through it. Thank you. You know, it get, get it gets perfected as it jiggles from committee to committee. Yeah. Like this one, the one that I got, which I was going off of, seemed to have no additions. You know, there's no underlines in this. You know, it's just pure. And then, you know, when we have things, some parts of this are highlighted with the word delete in it. What I think would be very helpful is to just start, and I, you know, I printed out the whole ordinance as it is now. When we consider something an ordinance of this complexity, for feeble, feeble minds like myself, it would be good to have this. And I think you can even do this with Microsoft Word, just do a compare document and have it just show where all the changes are. Because otherwise, the complexity of this, I feel like I'm going to, something is going to fall through the cracks and I'm not going to catch. Okay. Just as a general comment, but I certainly understand it better for your explanation. So, okay. so thank you. Well, for council, I don't know if you, I mean, I don't know if this happens in translation. Yeah. You know, when I send a document to Pam yeah, yeah, and then. 
Oh, sure. It takes you know yeah, takes sure. away some of the I'm sure. underscoring yeah. or what have you, but I'd be happy to take the whole sign ordinance and yeah. sort of do a mashup with the proposed changes if that helps with Thursday. Um, that would certainly be helpful to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Though yeah. we, it's tough because people would actually have to kind of have it earlier to because it becomes more substantial. And, and you know, in the midst of council, nobody really has a chance to read the whole thing. I mean, it's nice to have if you can sit down with it and try and figure it out in advance, but they're not going to get it prior to Thursday. But if it's redlined, would that that would make a difference? You don't think? Well, I mean, you know, if the whole thing and these instead of being redlined pulled out of context, they're redlined within right. the seven two. Yeah. I don't know. Just bold underline for addition, strike through for, or however you want to do it. Yeah. It could be red. But you'd have to, well, you're going to come Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. And do this presence. You can just bring them with you in that way. Okay. Because getting them to us now before then. I mean, advance would be good. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can at least get an electronic version and see it red food because right. if Pam prints it out, it's going to be all black and white. Okay. Um, so you got to so. bring it with you. And frankly, you know, at this point, um, since there's no changes in it, you're, you're not changing its content, you're just changing the way we look at it. It wouldn't matter that it hasn't been posted anywhere because it's. No, yeah, it's all the same thing. It's, it's all the same thing, just how right. yeah, when you stick it back, composite in the document. Right. And I, I appreciate how you have to juggle all these versions too, so it's not in any way mm -hmm. where it isn't. And do you, would it be. I think it would be easier, but I don't want to do it unless you're okay with it. I mean, I guess it depends on how you vote this forward. But, um, you know, I highlighted the things that came out of planning board that weren't originally in the introduced version. Mm. Does it matter to you anymore? I mean, once it, on Thursday, does it matter that it doesn't distinguish between what was introduced and what was um, added afterwards? My opinion. Mm -hmm. My opinion is that. If we're going to vote on something, we should vote on just one clean. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of what we do is tonight we take whatever came from whatever Edlu's known as now mm -hmm. and from the planning board and it's this is the final composite version that we approve it as amended by everybody. Okay. So then when it gets to council, it's one doc. Okay. Could you tell us a little bit because, um, you know, when we used to do the public hearings here, we knew what the public had to say, but now that it went over to the other committee, what public comment was there? For well, there was board? no public comment at community resources. There at planning board, there were um, some comments about the um, curfew mm -hmm. and about the um, particularly in the business district. Nothing really on the residential side, and then also the time, the allowance the, for being able to transition right. more regularly. Um, and we had not during the public hearing, but um, offline, <coughs> the property owner had indicated that that he was fine with the changes. He liked the fact that the city was going to, you know, put boundaries on LED signs and not allow it to be whatever goes in some big cities in the country. Um, but that um, you know there was a concern that it might regulate um, other types of LED signs, which, um, you know, they have LED strings that can direct light or wash light down on a sign. That's still allowed in this. It's not about it's just general message. lighting. It's going to be a mess. Right. Um, so really the conversation was around the, the points that are um, actually highlighted. And, we, and then there was some public comment in general about concerns about being too restrictive and making sure that we're, we're consistent across the board um, in commercial districts and residential districts. Mm -hmm. Alright, so what's your pleasure with this one? As, as whatever we move, we should move as amended so that we incorporate all of everybody's changes. I would have a hard time summarizing the policy changes. Doesn't sound like they're substantial. 
you know, if someone said, what is this ordinance? I would have a hard, I would, it kind of clarifies things, but I, I couldn't really explain if it expands you saying for restrictions on it, but anyway, if that's all the way of saying it, maybe a neutral recommendation is. Well, there's no, I mean, but the thing is, there really is no regulation on these things right. Right. now. Right. So this is our initial regulation, so it right. just sort of uh, limits their size, limits, you know, in two different zones. Mm -hmm. uh, it limits how bright they can be. Mm -hmm. It limits timing in two districts. It mm -hmm. sets up how long the, how long the display can change, so mm -hmm. it does. I mean, this is our first venture into this. And it codifies it. I mean, it used to be sort of these decisions were made on an ad hoc basis by right. the police chief. Right. You know? Right. And so it codifies the um, flashing signs, which now we're defining, newly defining as dynamic display boards to, to encompass this new technology. But it also creates differentiation between in sign lights between districts, which we haven't had. We just sort of treated all sign lighting the same without um, any um, restrictions on the time in which signs mm -hmm. can be eliminated. Um, so it does add some new regulations, but it also defines it and um, for things that have been kind of loose up to this point, we just sort of lumped LED signs into elimination. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, no. <clears throat> I mean, it has, has, has that virtue, but it's, it's kind of a collection of dimensional regulations and times and other numbers. That I don't know if I have a recommendation on it personally, but mm -hmm. whatever the committee wants to do is fine. Yeah. Well, you want to, I have no trouble sending it with a neutral recommendation. You know, it's been here. We approved all the various modifications, and we're sending it along with a neutral recommendation so it goes to council, and council can have its way with it. Because I'm neutral, I would defer to if anyone else wants to move something else. That's what told me. You've heard it in your committee as well, so you right. have a better sense of. Um, you've seen it from two perspectives now, so whatever. I mean, I'm fine with giving a neutral recommendation as well. Um, Make the motion. Move to uh, seventy thousand neutral recommendation. Why is that? Good. Any more discussion? I vote no. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now we got one more for you. You can talk to us a little about the next one, too. What's the next one? Um, uh, delete subdivision. It's a subdivision. 16.028, uh, an ordinance to delete subdivision of the land from Chapter 290 of the Code Book. Positive recommendation from Indiana Community Resources. And I think that's the only other place it really went. So um, let me just read it. Uh, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the code of ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended by uh, revising Chapter 290 of said code, providing that uh, for the subdivision of land be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in the City Council assembled as follows. Section 1, that Chapter 290 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended. Uh, so that such section reads as follow, delete. And then it goes on with that evil reference to the uh, subdivision of land regulations listed on the city website. <laughs> uh, that we've already not appreciated. So I'm assuming, I'm assuming that uh, that stuff's all in 350 now, isn't it? Yeah. No. The subdivision regulations are a separate, um, they're in their own chapter now, 290. The issue is that city council has no jurisdiction over subdivision regulations. Only the planning board can adopt changes to the subdivision regulations. So um, a city solicitor felt that it was inappropriate to have it under the code of ordinances when it's um, a separate regulatory under separate, defined separately as a regulatory um, mechanism. So how's it going to appear? As It'll be a link from our web, from probably the planning office's um, web page to um, just a separate um, rules and regulation, set the rules of, and regulations of subdivision in the city of Northampton. Mm -hmm. 
my only question was, um, what is the process by which you would have to then readopt all these? Or would you, because I would hate to delete them and have them not exist anywhere. And then, would you have to put in the regulations first before we get rid of, we pull them? Um, you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. Yeah. I don't think they go away. I think the ordinance says you're deleting them from the code book. So that you're not deleting the ordinances. You're deleting them from oh, appearing in the city's code. So we take it that they've been adopted. They've been adopted by the planning board and it's code. a standalone thing. Uh -huh. our, we originally <coughs> our office thought it would be make sense to have it thrown in with all the other codes like everything that's relevant to any rules that you might want to know about in the city of Northampton in one location yeah. and that's how they got in there but they're always they've already always been adopted yeah. as a separate yeah. so, so they're not that. they're not ordinances per se so let's not stick them in with the ordinances right yeah. okay. so that's a chapter of the code we couldn't amend if we wanted to so mm -hmm. it's kind of silly to right well, we can cause enough trouble without those. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so, do we have a motion on that one? We have a positive recommendation. Second. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Well, well I, would, I would amend to take out the reference. Oh, the okay. email like reference that. to the website. <laughs> I would put in Carolyn's cell phone number. <laughs> so, no, the cell phone. Like, you'll be sure to get her there in case she told us she forgets it. Um, so, are you. Are you uh, just All happy with that amendment? Should we yeah. officially adopt the amendment to the website? It just says reserve. That's what it just said. Oh. All right. Then all in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Thank you. Thank you. And I understand it, that uh, ordinance regarding parking on Center Street is waiting for uh, transportation, and ordinance pertaining to water resources is awaiting, is awaiting public works committee, so we don't have those to do tonight until, until our next meeting. Leading us up to new business. Does anyone have any new business other than what happened to Councilor Adams? Uh, <laughs> you know what happened to him? I don't know. Search party. Is he six though? I don't know. He was. He looked pretty good last time I saw him, but you never know. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, hearing no new business, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Right. We're done.